Hello and welcome. I know that people are still signing in, so we might just give it a couple seconds before we start talking at you. We can talk amongst ourselves in the meantime. <laughs> um, if, if you are just joining us, um, if you want to find the questions tab in the panel and let us know where you're joining us from, that's also where, where you will be asking questions um, during the presentation and during the Q&A portion. So it would be great to go ahead and find that and we would love to know where you're coming from. We've got Anne from Raleigh, North Carolina, Olympia, Washington. Washington. If you're just joining us, um, I'm orienting folks to where the questions tab is and asking people just to let us know where they're calling in from. Um, and also just so that you can find where the questions tab is for your questions. We've got San Francisco, Idaho, Garden Grove, California, Washington, DC, Dallas, Texas, more North Carolina, Michigan, Nevada, Great. That's fun. Yeah, well, welcome. Um, I am Kelly. I'm part of our community and programs teams here at Guidepost. Um, and I also do a lot of work with our elementary distance learning program. And I also happen to be a former Montessori elementary teacher. So I just wanted to mention before we get started that this is going to be recorded. Um, and if you would like to revisit it or share it with someone else, you can find it in the elementary family framework. Uh, which is at elearning.guidepostathome.com under the topics section. Um, if you have questions while Lisa is talking, um, and I know she has some questions she's going to post to you before she gets started, or maybe in the beginning at least, um, you can put them in the questions tab and we will circle back at the end during the Q&A section. So let's go ahead and test that out. If you haven't yet, just let us know where you're calling in from just to make sure that you know where that is. So I'm very excited to introduce Lisa Kathleen. This is actually our sixth webinar that we've worked on together. Um, and she's going to be sharing her wisdom with us today. She um, wears many hats and has worn many hats as an AMI um, elementary guide as a Montessori parenting coach, parenting educator, teacher trainer, writer, editor, and Montessori mom. I'm sure I'm missing something, but, but that gives you a, a little bit of a taste. Um, and she's equally passionate about Montessori and parenting. So I'm very excited to be collaborating with her again today, and I'm gonna turn it over to her. Welcome everybody, I'm very this is one of my favorite things to do. I love connecting with families and I love sharing about Montessori. So I'm super excited to do that as we all come into probably what is going to be a very different summer than what we're usually experiencing. I'm gonna start just by giving a really brief introduction to myself, that's me and there's my daughter. She um, is about four, almost five in that picture. She's 14 now. And I am part of the Prepared Montessorian teacher training team here at Guidepost and the parent of Elizabeth, that's her, um, doing the practical life task of baking cookies. I'm a trained Montessori guide for six to 12 year olds with years of classroom experience. So I've spent most of my adult life surrounded by elementary age children. And as I was thinking about putting this webinar together, I also remembered that I spent a couple of summers running a day home for elementary age children, which was lots of fun. I've also run my own business as a parenting coach and parent educator, as well as working in classrooms with younger children, so toddlers and, and three to six year olds as well. So we are in a very interesting and challenging time right now, personally, for many of us, for sure, and also culturally. And it's my belief that the Montessori approach is the way to support children and families during times like this. So many of us are anticipating, as I mentioned before, a very different summer this year with more time at home, fewer, if any, options for summer camps, possibly less time for kids to play outside with friends, 
So the really good news is that the practical life tasks of home life are both engaging for children of this age and also very beneficial. So I'm really excited to share today about the topic of our webinar, which is practical life tasks, particularly over the summer. So Kelly is going to share some poll questions. Uh, and I actually just have one question in the poll for you today. I'd really like to know how old your children are so that I can target a little bit to your ages, uh, to the ages of your children. And then once you have responded to this poll, well, go ahead. I'd like to hear from Kelly as the responses are coming in. But once you have responded to the poll, please pop over back into the questions tab and let us know what you're hoping to get out of the webinar today. And I'm going to have Kelly read some of those out as well so I can get a sense for particularly why people are here. So once you've responded to the poll, go ahead and pop in the questions tab and let us know what you're hoping to get out of the webinar today. Looks like we've got about 85% of our attendees have voted, um, but I do see some trends emerging. It looks like um, our largest group is six to seven year old um, parents, parents of six to seven year olds, I should say. Uh, we've got a quarter that are eight to 10, that's sort of the next largest group. And 17% are 11 and up. And then we have a smaller contingent that's under five um, or five years old. Great, thank you very much. That's super good. Great. And let's see, did your presentation disappear? There it is. <laughs> good, and then Kelly, are you seeing any comments in the questions tab about what people are hoping to get out of the webinar today? Yep, they're just starting to trickle in. I've got um, how to keep my kids interested in practical skills, how much of the day could we reasonably expect our children to be able to spend on practical life. Um, let's see, hoping to get some great life skills for my daughter to keep her busy, but I also work from home. Um, some ideas and structure for at-home learning. Got it. Okay, super. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. That's very helpful as I kind of put my head around the direction that we go. And I'm going to mostly follow my plan, and then I'm going to possibly toss in a little bit of feedback around some of these points. And then at the end, we will also take questions. So anytime that you have a question throughout the webinar, please put that in the chat as well. So my goal today is to give you a really strong overview of what kinds of practical life activities are a good fit for elementary age children. And you'll see different kinds of activities popping up as examples throughout the webinar. I'm also gonna to talk to you a little bit about how to tap into the natural motivation of children this age and how to introduce and guide the activity so that your child is successful and engaged. If you're not already part of our Family Framework Forum, I also would love to direct you there. There's a great article um, on this topic there. And I also highly recommend that you start with the overview of the Family Framework for elementary aged children specifically. So if you're trying to organize your summer with your children, the overview for the Family Framework for elementary aged children is gonna be super helpful. Even though it generally applies to the school day and the school year, it will also particularly apply to the summer. And I think you'll see how there's an easy transfer there. So that'll really get you started off on the right foot. So the forum, I wanna also say that the forum is free and there is a section where you can post your questions so after this after the webinar if you have more questions that come up over the next few days please do post in the family framework on the question section in the elementary and then uh, tag Kelly or tag me and we will pop in and respond to your questions there as well and, and Kelly's gonna make that, sure that she said I just dropped that link in the chat and so, someone also asked so please look in the chat on um, the questions tab if you want to know how to find that Perfect, thank you. Good. So I am going to start off today with a story that some of you may have already heard, and it's a story about what young children are capable of. One day when my daughter was about three and a half, I, for one of the first times ever, left her alone 
with a friend of mine. She was picked up from school at about noon and she came home with this friend and another couple of children to have lunch at my house while I was out parenting coaching. Uh, so this was the first time I had someone besides me really pick her up from school. And so I was off doing some parenting coaching over the lunch hour and I returned about an hour and a half later. And as I was coming up the front steps, I thought, oh, I forgot to leave lunch for my daughter. I knew the others would have come with a pack lunch, but I had made no provisions for my own daughter's lunch. So I came up the steps, I opened the front door and I said, hi everybody, I'm so sorry. I forgot to leave lunch for Elizabeth. And my friend looked over, she put up her hand and she said, don't worry about it. She fried herself an egg. She was three and a half. And in that moment, as a parent, it really jumped out at me how amazing it was that my three-year-old could do that on her own. And of course, as a Montessori teacher, I knew that the perspective that I'd always had about practical life was a big part of the reason that she was capable of doing that and doing it safely to the point that the other adult nearby felt totally confident allowing her to do that process. So in this picture, she's actually making pancakes. And as you can see here, she's a little bit older. And here she is a couple of years after that. Here she was about six. And this was the summertime. And she paid me back the $18.27 for ice and lemons and sugar. And she earned about $40 that day after paying me back for the supplies. So this is one of the things that you can consider for the summer and maybe not a lemonade stand, but entrepreneurism in general is an amazing practical life task for children of this age. So one of the, the principles that I wanna share with you today is that practical life activities are naturally motivating for elementary age children. They're real activities. So when a child completes a practical life activity, they end up with a tangible, real world benefit. Whether it's the pancakes that they get to eat or share with the family, or a shirt that they made to wear, or a clean and shiny bike, or maybe a redesigned bedroom. Whatever the thing is that the child is doing in a practical life situation, results in a practical, real world, tangible benefit or result. And that's what makes these activities so very motivating to children. They also have real consequences. So the consequences are also in real life. They're visible. And if what you're doing doesn't work, then there are real consequences. Not everything you do is going to be acceptable to other people. For example, when you try and fail with a practical life activity, there are real consequences, often consequences that affect other people. So the consequences may involve cleaning up afterwards or repairing something that you broke or having to do it over again or going hungry or something else. And it reminds me of one of the stories in Anne of Green Gables, which is a great book for elementary age children. If you haven't read this book, I highly recommend it. And at one point she made a cake and she made a cake for the minister's wife who was coming over for the first time. And she added liniment oil to the cake instead of vanilla. That's the real world consequence. Everyone sitting around the table and taking a bite of that cake. Another friend of mine oiled his bike to make it shine and the whole bike ended up in a layer of dust that stuck to the oil. So those real consequences make a big difference to the child. When my brother was fresh out of high school and drinking too much beer with his buddies, my parents sent him out to our cabin to repaint it and he somehow missed the instructions about where to find the paint. So he found some other cans of paint and he painted the entire cabin red instead of gray. 
and had to repaint the entire cabin. So that's the real consequence of a practical life error. So practical life activities teach us to check and to double check. They teach us to clarify, to confirm, to follow the steps carefully, to think ahead, and to pay attention along the way. These kinds of skills, the ones that I just listed, are called executive function skills. So the executive function skills are the suite of skills that are the most important skills for lifelong success and happiness, both personally and professionally, that same suite of skills. When you have strong executive function skills, you can set meaningful goals and achieve them. And practical life activities help practice and build those executive function skills. So it's the understanding of cause and effect, the ability to organize and to plan, to prioritize. It's delaying gratification, waiting until you get to the end point. The muffin comes after all day working to make muffins. Working memory, persistence and grit is built. Impulse control, concentration and problem solving abilities. So all of these things are built when you do practical life activities. That's of course, in addition to all of the academic skills that practical life activities help you to develop. So here's my daughter, and I'm not gonna review this in detail, but suffice it to say that my daughter had to write down the shopping list had to learn something about how fast ice melts in the hot sun and had to practice or did practice subtraction all day long on the day she sold lemonade, trying to figure out when she had earned more than she owed me for supplies and how much more she had earned. The other thing that is developed with practical life skills are social skills and the other benefits are social benefits. So the benefits of the activities themselves are often shared by others. So you get appreciation for what you've done. The work that it takes to do practical life activities is also often shared with others. So you work as a team to do the activity or you learn from someone else. Also, any consequences to mistakes made or learnings experienced while you're doing practical life activities are often shared with others as well. So you're very likely to receive feedback from others about what you've done and to understand how what you've done affects them. Empathy is another one of the executive function skills that's also a social skill that is developed through practical life activities. So here's another principle. Practical life activities inspire gratitude. When a child does a practical life activity, they discover that it's harder than it looks. They discover that dinner doesn't magically appear on the table or that the garage isn't magically organized in such a way that they can find the things they need. Or that the car doesn't magically get clean and that it takes time and effort and skills to do the things that make the family work. So let's shift gears a little bit to talk about how we inspire our elementary age children to do some of these practical life activities. One thing to know is that elementary age children don't naturally like to keep things tidy and organized, but elementary age children are very socially motivated. Let's talk a little bit more about what that means. They're highly motivated 
by the sense of responsibility towards others. So, which almost seems backwards because we think, you know, really they're responsible to others. They are, they want to be responsible to others. They want to be part of our society. So that includes friends and it includes family. So to inspire your child to take on responsibilities for practical life activities in the family, emphasize appreciation for the activity and emphasize how you all work together to make the family work. And I really love this picture. This actually was one day that uh, we were bike riding with these two friends of ours. My daughter is one of the, the children here and she was probably about eight at this time and we were out biking and we came across an abandoned pagoda and one of the three children said, hey, let's. And immediately they all began to work together to clean up the pagoda. The boy in the white here, you can see him on the left. He's made a broom out of the branch there. And the girl squatting down, she has improvised a dustpan. Because children of this age are so socially motivated, hey, let's is a very powerful way to start a suggestion. So how do we actually prepare our children of this age to get started and to do some of these practical life activities? The first thing is to plan ahead together. Start by building buy-in and building enthusiasm by making a plan together. So have a conversation that starts with, hey, let's all work together to make our family run this summer. Here are some of the things we can do. Ask your child if there's any specific things that they would like to do. It might be cooking or it might be baking or washing the car or hanging pictures, or it might be a bigger family project like planting a garden or wallpapering a room or turning the garage into a crafting area. So start by brainstorming a really long list of possibilities, all the things you could do and you do do on a regular basis around your home. Some of these things can be things that your child can already do on their own, and others might be things that they need to do with a sibling or with parents. But once you've chosen some of the things that you want to do, if your child can already do them independently, go ahead and schedule them in. If there are some bigger projects, then remember to include your child in the project planning. Break down the planning into smaller chunks so that your child can learn the steps that it takes to plan independently. So part of what you're doing here is teaching the skill of breaking a project down and scheduling it in. Planning itself is a practical life activity. So your older child particularly may want to plan a family camping trip or be in charge of the shopping list each week. So think. Think of the things that your children can take responsibility for in the family. And then break down the actual activity to teach the steps. So we just talked about teaching the steps for planning, but later as you get more in detail into a particular activity, you need to teach those steps too. So let's think about scooping cookie dough onto the tray, for example. My daughter was a little bit younger here, but you will likely need to teach even an older child how to break this process down. You need to show exactly how to scoop just the right amount on the first spoon, then where to tuck the second spoon into the first spoon and how to slide it down carefully onto the tray. Rather than explaining what you're doing, you're gonna show them exactly how to do it and then have them try. With a new task, you might wanna do it together a few times before your child does it on their own. This is especially true for your six, seven, five, six, seven, eight-year-olds. Once the children are a little bit older, you can do more, more verbal explaining 
uh, but you can always write the steps down and see how your particular child responds to or is capable of reading and repeating some of those steps. Another thing that we really focus on in Montessori in general is preparing the physical environment. So you want to think about what would it take? Well, so let me just say it this way. What did it take for my three-year-old to be able to fry herself an egg? It took a pan stored where she could reach it. It took a small bottle of oil that she could manage to pour into the pan. It took a sturdy school stool with side railings. And actually, she's got a chair here in this picture, but we, we also had a big sturdy stool with side railings that she particularly used when she was working on the stove for a longer period of time or beside the stove. With, it took eggs stored in the bottom portion of the fridge. And it took practice turning on the stove while standing far away, and it took her knowing that she had to ask an adult to come and watch during the time that she was working on the stove or near the stove and to be nearby. And it took practice cracking and then flipping the egg. So all of these things went into preparing the physical environment so that my three-year-old could fry herself an egg even when I wasn't there. So my girl, same child here on the right, is now 14. And, as, and um, she has done, since quarantine began, about half of the cooking in our home. I've had eggs benedict, and I've had tacos, and I've had salmon, and I've had hamburgers, and I've had chocolate chip cookies, and I've had chocolate lemon cake delivered to me on the couch while I'm working. And did I mention deep fried Boston cream donuts? Who could ask for more? So there are these long-term benefits of practical life activities and even short-term benefits too, as your young children cook for you. So you may be very, very surprised at how much your child can do independently if you just teach the steps and then set up the environment for their success. So let's think now about what it would take for your six-year-old to be the official present wrapper of the household. The tape, the scissors, a nice long ruler so that they can cut a straight line, and wrapping paper needs to be stored where it can be easily found by the child, where the child knows where it is. And a certain area needs to be designated, not the dining room table that can be scratched with scissors for wrapping presents, and a few fun YouTube videos maybe need to be curated so that you can get your child's creative juices flowing. What about preparing the environment for your eight-year-old to be the snack provider every day during the summer holidays? So first, they might need help choosing recipes on the weekend so that when baking day comes around, they're ready to go. Maybe they need cheese to slice and a cheese slicer that fits that particular brick of cheese with crackers to go along in the right shapes and sizes. They need veggies to clean and slice and then ingredients for cream cheese dip in a list somewhere or in, in their, their recipe collection. They need celery, nut butter and raisins to make ants on a log. And maybe they need a designated assistant. Who should they ask if they're stuck or they're not in the mood? What would it take for your 12-year-old to sew some of his own back-to-school shirts or to paint the fence? It would probably take some lessons on how to open and close the paint cans, how to store the brushes, how to manage knot holes and edges, and possibly a couple of willing helpers. So in all of this, the other principle that we really want to keep in mind is that let some things go. You might need to help cleaning up afterwards. It may take a lot longer to get the job done in the first place. 
and you should be prepared to help solve problems along the way. And then be okay with your child not doing things as well as you would have done them. So the flour all over the kitchen or the soaking wet clothes after the dog's bath are very small things in the grand scheme of what your child gains from practical life activities. So this presentation was short and sweet, and I'm gonna address some of the specific questions that came up at the beginning right away, and then we're gonna dive into any more questions that are popping up. Kelly, do you have anything top of mind that you wanna start with? Sure. Um, let's see, you had mentioned that you wanted to kind of go back to what was asked at the beginning. So one of the, yes, the questions that came up in different forms, so it, it seems like it would be good to address, is how much of the day could we expect our child to be able to spend on practical life? Yes, that's a great question. So I would say that this is going to depend very much on the child and on the habits that you've already established going into the summer. If you are in a household where your family has had a really, um, you know, you, you've maintained a really specific schedule for schoolwork, for example, Maybe you're going to continue to plan some things ahead and have those two hours booked off for some type of um, ac more academic activity. Or maybe you're going to balance it out so that you're working together with your child to plan some things in. Regardless of the amount of time to be expected, you know what, actually, I'm going to back up a little bit because I think maybe this question is getting at, um, you know, thinking of practical life activity as chores for the child to do. So I, I wanna start with that. So how much time does it make sense to dedicate to chores that the child does? This also fits in in the grand scheme of things. What makes this child pick and what keeps this child happy? You wanna think in the really big picture. So what kind of chores are the best for your particular child to do? Which are the chores that they're more likely to do? You might have a child that is perfectly happy, for example, to clean the bathtub, if only you will do the dishes, right? So you, you really want to target and specialize around what each child is doing and how they contribute to the family. So if that was part of the question, I wanna throw that in first. Now, regardless of what other th so so you want to start then by figuring out all of the things that you're going to schedule into the day every day during the summer i still recommend especially for elementary age children that during the summer you you differentiate between the weekend and the days of the week so during the days of the week you may want to have more of a schedule with your child then you're going to make your list of all of the things that need to happen in the day and work with your child to plan that schedule. I would keep a checklist. Now, you might have a child that will spend the entire day happily doing practical life activities. That is great. There's absolutely no reason to restrict those practical life activities in my mind. If they are actively working to be a part of the household and the family, um, by doing practical life activities, I would, I would personally definitely encourage that. Now, you may also want to balance that with some academic maintenance type activities over the summer, whether that's reading or whether that's writing or whether that's doing a few math facts every day. So if you're doing that kind of thing, again, work with your elementary age child, plan together with them, figure out when's the best time of the day to do that. What supports do they need to make that happen? Maybe those are the activities that you do just after dinner time because they really like to do it with an adult. So really, again, thinking and targeting and specializing to your particular child. Kelly, do you have anything to add to that? That was kind of a very long answer to that question. No, that, that was super thorough. And while you were talking, Janice chimed in and said, I love checklists. Um, <laughs> we do have someone that asked a follow-up question, so I'll... Um, I'll go to that because while you were talking, it, um, she said, what happens if kids are just not motivated to do the things that we have already planned? 
So sometimes they are not motivated to do the things you've already planned. So there's a couple things to have in mind there. At the, at the elementary age, responsibilities are responsibilities, and you want to make sure that the child is following through on some of those responsibilities. But we all go through times that we're more or less motivated. So how can you support your, your child through that? And maybe that means sometimes you're gonna reschedule with your child. So you sit down with them and say, okay, so these are the responsibilities. If you don't wanna do this now, what happens if we switch this to tomorrow? What would be the best time of the day to make sure it gets done tomorrow, for example? Or is this one that we could put off till this weekend and then we'll do it together because you're having a tough time following through on that one? I think um, part of the, the situation can be getting stuck in, um, in digital devices. And if, if it's a situation where the child is kind of craving digital device time versus doing some of these other activities, I think sometimes the solution is also boredom. So you want to really make sure that your child and you together are prioritizing the things that are going to result in health and happiness for your child. And so it's certainly fine to say, hey, I see that you're very interested in you know, playing that game for even a longer period of time, but I also have this expectation, you know, we you have a responsibility to complete this task because the family is depending on you, um, and I'm happy to adjust the timing of it, but let's work together to figure that out. Uh, and um, it's important to me that you have, you, that you're spending your time in a way that makes you happy and healthy. And to do that, it means that, you know, as far as, you know, the research we looked at last week goes, we know that two hours a day on media is, is probably more than most people can handle and remain feeling happy and healthy. So, I mean, I'm just kind of trying to think of all of the contingencies around the question. And so the more uh, elaboration that I have on questions, the better. So please do feel free to elaborate and, and let me know if that actually responded to the particular question. All right. Hyatt asks, I'm hoping for a reminder of specific developmental needs for early elementary children and more ideas for tasks for them. More ideas for tasks for the early elementary children. So the first thing I'd love to do is ask anyone who has children of this age that are doing practical life tasks on a regular basis to toss them into the chat and then we'll follow up about that in a little while. Is I know we, we have a list um, that we shared with our guidepost schools um, when we went to this distance learning model that I can share um, for the six to eight year old. We Some of the things that our program um, experts came up with were laying out clothes for the next day, showering on your own, vacuuming and sweeping floors, uh, retrieving packages from outside of the front door, folding laundry and putting it away, um, assisting with outdoor work, shoveling, raking, sweeping, shaking out rugs, um, and ma making basic meals, like Thanks. sandwiches and heating up leftovers. So those are a couple ideas that might be helpful. Great, and then hopefully others are popping some ideas into the chat as well. Um, in that area, what I'd like to say is this is going to vary widely between children. So you really want to target to your particular child. And every time that you're doing a practical life in the house, task in the house, or every time you're looking at something and thinking, oh, I wish we could get that done, put it on the list and see if your particular child might be capable of doing it or capable of helping with it if given the right supports. Or if there's a particular part of the task that they could do, you know, occupying a role of, of sorting if maybe they can't reach a certain, you know, I don't know, if they can't reach where the silverware is stored. Hopefully they can. That would that, that probably would be something that would be important, but you get the idea. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I got a couple of questions um, actually about if there are community service ideas. Um, a parent said, without Girl Scouts, like, what can we do virtually? I am so glad I'm so glad you brought this up because this is actually a, a big 
part of the tendency towards social um, or, or of social motivation for the elementary age child. The elementary age child is highly service oriented. Typically, they they really, you know, they feel things deeply when they see something that is happening out there in the world and they want to fix it. So one of the things that uh, actually happened in my elementary classroom was that the children themselves would research which charities they would like to earn money for and then they would do some activity to earn the money so that they could then send that money to the charity. So the process itself is really important here. So think about if your child loves animals, are there three or four, um, and again, I'm thinking for a six or seven year old, how would you kind of scaffold the research process? If your child loves animals, are there three or four um, charities that might be a good fit for your child? So if then you could have them look at those different charities and compare them and learn some information about them and see which one they would like to earn money for, for example, or that they would like to volunteer for. Maybe you will go with them and be a dog walker on the weekend, for example. Um, and then taking a look at what, what activity they could do to earn money for that particular charity or to earn money for an for their own personal project, right? So all of these things, are, do you see that I'm always starting with the child? What interests your child and how can we go from there? I know um, children in my class always like doing bake sales and I don't know, you know how easy that translates to this time just because you don't necessarily want your children um, interacting with other folks, but uh, they would also love to do craft sales and i was thinking about you know if your child is crafty that maybe that's something they could sell and mail um to people to earn money and i know you asked, the, the parent asked about virtual um community service um so i was thinking about like connecting with maybe an isolated senior online um you know to read a book or just have a conversation or maybe an, an elderly relative um, that's homebound right now, I'm sure would, would love that connection. Um, or parents with young children, um, you know, to read a younger child a story if your child is a reader already. And this is not virtual, which I know is what you asked about, but it's some of those same um, tasks that we talked about that might be appropriate for elementary age children um, might also be able to be done in the neighborhood. Like you could weed a neighbor's garden or maybe drop off um, a dish um, if you have someone that you know, it's not, not able to get away or is not comfortable going to the grocery store right now. That might be some other things they can do. Actually, I, I want to kind of hop off on that, Kelly, and this is kind of a combination of virtual and um, local, which is that in my neighborhood, I joined the next door community, which there's pros and cons to that for sure. But <laughs> in the door community on my neighborhood, they were asking for masks and my daughter sews. So she sewed in a period of about a month over a hundred masks for people locally in my neighborhood. And she donated some of those, but she also sold some of them for her own, you know, for her own uh, kind of collection of tasks and, and um, goals that she has for after, uh, after quarantine. I think so you, thank you notes are also another great um, community service idea. You know, there's so many organizations or essential workforce um, people that uh, could use that appreciation and that can be emailed or mailed um, so you don't have to, to leave the home for that. Great, thank you. And Kelly, are there any ideas that have popped up in the chat from families? Um, we didn't get any quite yet. Yeah, so if, if anybody has suggestions for um, activities or community service, we would love to hear, hear from others. That would be great. Thank you. Um, let me see if we have any new questions. It doesn't look like we have anything that we haven't sort of already gone over. Um, definitely some themes from earlier about sort of how, how to juggle the dual parent working household and um, engaging children, which I think you, you pretty well covered. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. 
I do. I have one thing to add to the organizing of the day. And so here's where that master list becomes very important. It's nice to have at the beginning of the summer, and this is something that my daughter and I always do at the beginning of a summer or beginning of spring break, the beginning of any sort of extended period of time that we're going to be in a certain situation that there's a lot of free time. And that taking that time to really brainstorm together and create a long list of things that could be done. And, and when you have that long list, it's a lot easier to then sit down on a daily basis and transfer some of those items into a shorter list. So now you've got this long list, you're transferring them into a shorter list, and then you can uh, plan daily which times of the day specifically are going to be used for which kinds of tasks. And so, for example, you may say something like, up until noon, we have, you know, we, we do a little bit of academic practice work and we do a little bit of our project work and we do, a, you know, our practical life tasks and jobs around the house. And then in the afternoon, that's free time. And so now you might take the time to break down your master list into morning activities and afternoon activities. And this way you create, create a little bit of a flow to each day so that your children can have something to draw on. And I guess what, I, what, what comes to mind here is that children in today's world don't have much practice being bored. So we really need to scaffold their boredom. So if you get to be bored, here are the things you can do. If it's morning and it's between 10 and noon, here's the list of things that you can consider. If it's afternoon and it's between two and four, here's the list of things that you can consider doing. If it's on the weekend, here's the list of things that you can consider doing. And uh, maybe your weekend activities include more activities that you ask parents about, for example, or that you ask parents for help with. Um, and with the practical life activities, the other thing that I want to really draw attention to is the process of teaching. With the elementary child, whenever possible, have a checklist so that when they finish the activity, they can tell if it's done. I, I often like to tell my daughter, the question is not, did you sweep? The question is, is the floor clean? Right. So it's a very different question with the elementary age child than it would be with the younger child. So a child five and under, very often the, the focus is on the sweeping, not every single detail of the final result, but the elementary child starts to shift their attention and have the ability to focus a lot more on the result versus the process. So that elementary age child really needs to have um, kind of a mastery-based approach to is the task complete? And so maybe that includes the cleaning of the kitchen and what exactly is involved in cleaning the kitchen, for example. We have a Kelly, another follow-up question um, from Anne who says she grew up in the 70s and 80s and we had a resource almost like an index card box um, of cards with ideas of what to do. I wonder if there's something like that now, uh, but not online because that just leads them back into the computer. I yeah, suggest exactly. It. <laughs> that would be a great practical. I suggest making it. I think that would be a great practical life activity. Um, I would Absolutely. be happy to send along in a follow up email some of the suggestions that we've developed. Um, you know, for our schools, our guidepost schools, um, I think that might be relevant for elementary. Yeah, definitely. And, and please notice, you know, we, we have the list of tasks um, in the PDF that is on the elementary portion of the website, and Kelly right. will, will include that link as well. Some of those tasks for older children should definitely be considered for the younger children as well. And some of the tasks that are listed as for younger children should be considered for older children as well. So those tasks that are listed for older children, 
may just need more scaffolding, and more support, and more breaking down of the steps if the younger child is to do some of those activities. But definitely, you know, when you come at any activity with that mindset of how do we break this down so that this child can can do the activity and what supports do they need in the physical environment, then it becomes much easier for the child to go ahead and do it independently. Anne also asked, how much do you schedule? How many activities? Two to three each morning and evening or afternoon, I guess? So you want to start again with that collaborative conversation with your child. What would be reasonable here is the question for the child. You want them to be on board with, okay, there's three tasks scheduled this morning. Or, okay, there are five tasks scheduled this morning. If the five tasks are smaller task, tasks, maybe this is a morning for five tasks. If the three tasks are slightly bigger tasks, or there's two smaller and one very big task, then three tasks in a morning might be reasonable. I would say typically one to five tasks in a morning or one to five practical life activities in a morning makes sense. And, and I'm using, you know, task really makes it sound like it's something the child has to do. The goal here is not to set your children up to do chores all day, right? The goal is to meet the child's need to feel like an important part or to be an important part of the family. So you really want to focus on the things that are specifically interesting and specifically motivating to your child rather than set them up to spend you know the morning doing five you know five large tasks that are not appealing or interesting to them and for sure they will and need to do some things that are not that fun but if you help them schedule those in throughout the day then it's going to be a lot easier for them to manage those tasks pamela so asked, i think I, oh sorry go ahead um i was Sorry, we're talking once. I was just going to say that, you know, I, I think the bottom line is you know, between one and five practical life tasks is probably a reasonable number for a morning time frame for a couple of hours. Yeah, that sounds good to me too. Um, Pamela asked, what was the suggested phrase or start of a sentence to use to engage a child in an activity? Hey, let's. Yeah. That's let's. Hot. Let's wash the car. Hey, let's hang all those pictures we were thinking of hanging. Perfect. Now that's not going to the time, right? It's a, and the point here is not that we're trying to make these things work. It's like, and, and there's a different mindset here too, right? We're really again engaging the child in the family life. So it's not so much that you're hoping that every time you say, hey, let's, your child will jump on board and do the thing with you. It's that every time you say, hey, let's, they're realizing again that they're part of a family. Yeah. Someone asked, um, what was the book that you referenced? I, I'm not sure which, I, I think I must have missed it. So I don't know if you can remember. Anne of Green Gables. Oh, oh, that's right. Okay. I'm Canadian. So Anne of Green Gables is, a, is, a, is written by a Canadian author, and it's a lovely, lovely book for children of this age. Yes, I've actually read that to my classroom, but for, I was thinking of a parenting book, and I couldn't remember which one, but that makes sense now. Um, let's see, I actually had two questions about where the recording of this session will be available. Um, I put this in the chat, but I'll also mention it again in case anybody missed it, which is that it will be inside the family framework. Um, and you can find that at elearning.guidepostathome.com. So if you go into the elementary section and go into topics, you will see this recorded webinar um, and all of the previous ones that we've done. You can actually also find it on the Guidepost blog, um, if that's easier, just guidepostmontessori.com forward slash blog. And we have um, all of our webinar series that we've done this year. And do make sure that the elementary portion of the family framework when you're looking for the webinar particularly. Yeah, thank you for, for that reminder. Well, I'm, I'm scanning to see um, if there are any other questions. Someone asked what was the name of the book again. It was Anne of Green Gables. 
Um, it looks like we don't have any more questions. So we might wrap up just, just a few minutes early unless there's anything else that you wanted to add. No, I don't think there is. Again, we would love to see all of you on the Family Framework and please come and share your practical life successes because as, you know, as we've really heard from this group, People really want to have ideas about different kinds of practical life activities. I hope we've brought many to the table here. We'll continue to add to them in our family framework chat. And we really encourage you to bring your successes in too, to take pictures and post them on the website if you can, so that we can all learn from each other and be inspired by each other over the summer. For have sure. Summertime, everybody. Um, Thank you so much, Lisa. And, and also, if people have questions after the webinar, if they, they have that moment where they're like, oh, I wish I had thought to ask that at the time, um, please also post those questions in the chat and um, Lisa and I can circle back and answer them if there's anything that we didn't get to. And I think yes, that's do tag Yeah, go ahead. Do feel free to tag us by name, Lisa Fahim and Kelly Haran. Yeah. You can go and ahead so and type. What, what's the link for the guidepost blog? Um, it's guidepostmontessori.com forward slash blog. And actually, I'm going to just go ahead and put that in the chat, but, and then I'm going to sign off. So you don't have to remember that. You can just copy and paste. So there you go. It's in the chat. And on that note, thank you, everybody. And thank you very much, Lisa. Until, until next time. Have a super summer, everybody. Yeah. Take care. All right. Bye.